The History of Poland podcast, episode 37. The baths aren't safe. Hello and welcome back. We left off last time with a stunning victory by Leszek the White in the east over the Kievan Rus. While Leszek was off fighting, Władysław Spindelshanks, the son of Miaszko the Old, has been ruling Krakow. But Leszek realized his standing has increased to such a degree that he can take up the position of senior Piast male, depose Władysław, and rule once again. Leszek marches on Krakow in the year 1206, sending word ahead to Władysław that his services are no longer required. Thank you very much. According to Jan Drugosz, quote, Władysław of Wielkopolska, a quiet, modest man, patiently accepts his dismissal and withdraws with his attendants to Poznan, end quote. Solidifying his position, Leszek then sends troops out to further attack the lands of the Rus, capturing most of their senior leadership, who Leszek then has executed. This further destabilizes the state of Kiev. Of course, Leszek's position isn't unassailable. Indeed, ruling is hard, especially when there are so many Pias relatives out there who are just about as strong as you. One of these people we've touched on but haven't formally introduced. That is Conrad, Leszek's younger brother, by three years. Drugosz tells us that, quote, Once Leszek has taken over the monarchy and the principality of Krakow, young Conrad starts to demand his share of their inheritance. He has long since come of age and naturally wants to be independent. This matter is debated at an assembly attended by the mother of the two princes, Gedko, Bishop of Płock, and Fulko, Bishop of Krakow, and, as well as the more eminent lords of all the duchies. After several days of talk, it is agreed that the territories involved are to be distributed between the two. End quote. The distribution leaves Leszek with the more favorable land centered on Krakow, and with Conrad becoming Conrad I, Duke of Mazovia. All present at the negotiations accept the outcome, with the bishops present declaring that anyone who breaks this settlement will be excommunicated from the church. Meanwhile, things are happening out there in the wide world, and I'll bet you'll never guess who's involved. That's right, Hungary and Kiev, which I suppose you might have guessed. After all, pretty much the only things we talk about right now involve domestic Polish disputes, arguing with the emperor, conquering Baltic lands, Bohemian raiding, Kievan feuding, and being frenemies with Hungary. This latest one falls into a mix of Kievan feuding and being frenemies with Hungary. The background here is that after the Polish defeat of the Rus, a bunch of the remaining Kievan leaders decide that they need to pick a new ruler. And wouldn't you know it, they all think that they're the best guy for the job. What a coincidence. Drugosz tells us that the elders, or as I call them, people with common sense, realize that this will lead to a bloody civil war, and that the only way to stop endless bloodshed is to get an outside broker. Poland is suggested, and just as quickly shot down, since they recently conquered them and they weren't really fondly looked upon. Then someone has the bright idea to reach out to Andrew, King of Hungary, and see if he's interested in resolving the dispute. Well, he is interested and he decides to send his son, Kalaman, to take over the area. Kalaman gets there with some of his troops, and settles in for a quiet life as ruler of the Rus. <laughs> no. Kalaman gets there and immediately decides to have the Catholic clergy with him crown him king, which doesn't go over well with the locals on two levels. First, they aren't Catholic, and second, no one asked them if they wanted him to be their king. They bide their time, though, and wait for the Hungarian troops to leave before acting against Kalaman. Eventually, the troops do leave, and the Rus strike back. At their head is Mstislav, who is coincidentally the very person that Kalaman unseated when he strode in. Mstislav is successful in unseating Kalaman and captures many Poles and Hungarians who are there. He does not treat them kindly, which I read as execution and slavery, so he's really not out to make friends. This then brings us to the year 1209. In this year, King Andrew of Hungary makes the fateful decision to go to war against Mstislav, looking to put his son Kalaman back on the throne. He sends word to Leszek that he would just love some Polish support, and Leszek dutifully sends a force of Polish knights. This combined force heads out to fight against Mstislav, everyone's hearts a flutter as they prepare for battle. The battle is a terrible loss for the Hungarians and Poles. Mstislav orders that every Pole and Hungarian found on the field is to be killed, leading to the unnecessary death of many people. Kalaman wasn't part of the fighting, but was with the garrison of a nearby castle, which Mstislav then besieges. Mstislav eventually captures Kalaman and his wife. That wife, a woman named Salomea, who just so happened to be the daughter of Leszek. Back in Poland, Leszek hears of the news of the defeat, but there's no record of how he reacted. 
I assume poorly, but he has a country to rule, and so he focuses for the time being on internal affairs. That is, until the Rus get too big for their britches and invade Poland in the year 1211. Drugos tells us about this, saying, quote, The Ruthenian dukes, puffed up with pride by their unusual successes against the Hungarians, make repeated raids into Poland, helped by the Lithuanians and indeed at their suggestion. They collect booty and hurriedly withdraw to their own country. As they never stay long in one place, they do enormous damage, and this so encourages them that they come to despise the Poles. Leszek, hurt to the quick, after much consultation, sends Sulisław and the Castellan of Sandomierz with a strong force to extract vengeance and put a stop to the raids. The Castellan marches into Ruthenia and proceeds to put it to fire and the sword. He rounds up a large number of captives and sends them back to Poland in chains. A handful of Ruthenian dukes now bar his advance and offer to do battle, which until then they had cunningly avoided. Early in the battle, the Poles break through the Ruthenian first line and scatter it, taking the Duke's prisoners, as well as many knights and ordinary soldiers, as many again must have been spitted on Polish swords. The Castellan orders the Ruthenian knights and nobles to be put in chains and sent to Poland, where many of them later regain their freedom thanks to the generosity of Leszek, while others are ransomed by their families. Sviatoslav and the other four dukes are kept in captivity, both as a punishment and as a safeguard for the future. All in the Polish army are enriched by their share of the booty. End quote. So the Rus are taken care of for a little bit, and Poland is a wee bit more secure. Which is nice. For the next few years, things are pretty calm in Poland, and Leszek seems to be ruling pretty well. Sure, his younger brother Conrad turns out to be a bit of a despot, but that's just what happens when you play the genetic lottery of who is going to be in charge next. Around the same time, Duke Władysław of Wielkopolska has to face down a challenge from his nephew, who is also called Władysław. He's victorious in defending his position, so there's not much change there. I only mention it because I wanted to point out that even when things are calm and peaceful in Poland, they are neither calm nor peaceful. And just outside of Poland, big things are happening. There's this group of people, called the Tartars, who we now call the Mongols. They are getting closer and closer. I won't dwell on them too long, since I want to spend more time talking about them in a future episode, but they do fight with the Rus for the first time just around this time and rout them in battle. The years continue to roll by until we get to 1219, when the leading nobles of Poland look at Leszek and realize, hey, this guy doesn't have any kids. He doesn't have an heir. What if he dies tomorrow? Who's going to be in charge? Drugosz tells us of the outcome, saying, quote, the nobles of Krakow, afraid that Leszek, who is 28, might die without progeny, and that they themselves will be under foreign rule, put pressure on the young duke to take a wife. Opinions are divided as to whom she should be, some advocating a union with Hungary, others suggesting a German, a Bohemian, or a Ruthenian bride, the latter suggestion having the greatest support because in these stormy times that would provide an opportunity to extend Polish dominion and at the same time restore peace to relations with Ruthenia, which have long been troubled by endless wars and misunderstandings. So Leszek marries Gerzmislava, daughter of Jaroslav of Ruthenia. The wedding is held in Krakow with considerable pomp and at great expense. Thanks to this marriage, Poland and Ruthenia enjoy the blessings of lasting peace. It also brings about the release of all prisoners of war, whether of the nobility or the peasantry. End quote. But while peace with the Rus is great and all, it's not as great as having food which is turning out to be a bit of a problem because Poland and the surrounding countries are about to endure a famine, initially instigated by a flood. The flood leads to a reduced level of food, not just for people, but for cattle. That lack of food for cattle then appears to have led to malnourishment. That malnourishment then led to a greater prevalence of disease. The lack of cattle then made farming more difficult, and on the spiral went. On top of this, a severe winter hits, further hurting the area. This general blight leads to an increase in disease, death, and general suffering in Poland. While it does lead to the establishment of a hospital in Krakow that is free and open to the public, that's little solace to the people who are suffering through this time. Drugosz tells us that this famine was no short affair, saying, quote, Two years of famine are followed by a third, and one that is far more severe. This proves fatal not only to domestic animals and people, but causes outbreaks of plague worse than those of the two previous years. Nevertheless, there is no compromise or mercy in the implementation of the law, and justice is administered in exactly the same way as in times of plenty. End quote. So there are some silver linings, but not many. As this famine is going on, Leszek is approached by a retainer of King Andrew of Hungary. 
Andrew had been off crusading in the Holy Land, and had just returned with plenty of fortune, and more importantly to Leszek, some relics of purported saints. The retainer says that while Andrew had been away, the border with Poland had been neglected, and that some payments need to be made. Leszek agrees. Then the retainer tells Leszek that Henry is going to invade Bohemia soon, and that when the time comes, he'd just love it if Leszek would join him. This, too, Leszek agrees to do, if not in person, then with an army that he'd send out ahead. This then leads to one of the more entertaining episodes of Leszek's life. You see, Leszek begins preparing his troops for this upcoming clash, when he receives word that there's a usurper in his lands. That usurper? A guy named Henry the Bearded. Now, if you'll think back a little bit, Henry the Bearded is the grandson of Władysław II, the Exile, who we talked about a few episodes back. Henry decides that he should be in charge, and that Leszek and his whole side of the family are usurpers themselves. Henry doesn't have a huge army, but he does have money that he can use to hire mercenaries. Henry does exactly that in 1225 and marches on Krakow. Drugos tells us what happens, saying, quote, Leszek is there waiting for them with his army in battle array and ready to fight. Henry is really quite a modest man, and he has been urged by his saintly wife, Jadwiga, to be content with Wrocław and not aspire to the monarchy. Now, seeing how much better and stronger Leszek's army is than his own, and that his own troops are intimidated by the strength of their opponents, Henry sends heralds to ask for a parley. To this, Leszek and Conrad agree, for both hate the thought of civil war, and a day and a place are fixed. Here the two sides meet, and it is agreed that Henry renounces all pretension to the monarchy and all that goes with it. Each then swears to promote the advantage and renown of the other, and to make no attempt to seize any of the other's lands or territory. They then exchange gifts, take part in a banquet, and return to their duchies, the best of friends. Leszek invites the other two dukes to Krakow, where he entertains them and their knights most lavishly. Conrad then returns to Mazovia, but Henry stays on for another week. Then, laden with gifts, he returns to Silesia, well content. End quote. Now, I don't really know if they parted the best of friends, but I have to say, Leszek seems to really know his business. He seems like the prototypical warrior diplomat, winning over enemies and staying true to his friends. He won over Henry the Bearded, who had just days before been planning to usurp Leszek. That takes skill, a skill and tact that Polish rulers didn't really seem to have at this time. Which is what makes the events of the following year that much sadder. The year 1227 rolls around, and our narrative shifts north, to Pomerania. There's a guy up there named Sviatopolk, surprise, who is acting as the governor. It's not the real title, but it's the closest thing we have. Well, Sviatopolk really wants to become a duke, because that would turn his title into a hereditary title, and would just be a swell thing to put on a resume. Leszek refuses, which deeply offends Sviatopolk. Sviatopolk begins to plot rebellion, which Leszek finds out about. Leszek then comes up with an idea. He'll invite Sviatopolk to come meet him to discuss matters of governance. Then, when he shows up, Leszek will have him arrested. Unfortunately, Sviatopolk sees through the ruse and comes up with a counterplot. That plot is to kill Leszek, his retainers, and Henry the Bearded, who is now accompanying Leszek. Drugosz tells us of the fateful meeting, saying, quote, Suspecting neither treachery nor trickery, and intending to act in moderation in recovering Pomerania, Leszek comes to the appointed place accompanied by Henry the Bearded and quite a considerable retinue. There they spend a couple of days in discussions with the Duke of Wielkopolska about prolonging the peace arranged between the latter and his uncle, the Duke of Gniezno, all unaware that they have walked into a trap. Next on the agenda is the question of compensation for damage done in the repeated raids by Pomeranians into Polish territory. Sviatopolk is now supposed to join them, but delays his arrival, sending instead a stream of messengers whose real purpose is to spy out the situation and report what is happening. On the fourth day, many matters having been disposed of, the dukes go to the baths to attend to their bodies. Informed of this, Sviatopolk seizes the opportunity and arrives with a considerable force of both Pomeranians and Poles, who force their way into the hostelries and tents of the dukes and knights, killing everyone who resists. When the dukes realize what is happening, Leszek, the youngest and strongest, leaps from the bath, and mounting a horse being held by one of his men, rides off with a few companions. Sviatopolk organizes a pursuit, telling his men that victory depends on their bringing him this one corpse. Though Leszek and his companions resist stoutly, they are all killed. Sviatopolk is so eager to get rid of the royal progeny and those who came with them that he has their knights and escort, even those naked in the bath, cruelly murdered. Henry the Bearded is also in the bath and received several wounds. Indeed, he would have been killed had not one of his knights, Peregrine of Weissenberg, 
shielded him with his own body. Peregrine receives several wounds and collapses, but his body still covers that of his duke, and their assailants depart, considering both to be dead. Leszek's body is taken to Krakow by the survivors of his retinue, and there buried in the cathedral. Sviatopolk, having murdered his liege lord, neither regrets it nor attends the funeral. From now on, he begins to act as the legitimate Duke of Pomerania. Henry is taken home to Wrocław on a litter. Once recovered, he lavishes gifts on Peregrine's children in recognition of their father's loyalty. End quote. And that is a terrible ending for Leszek the White, hunted down by someone who wanted the vanity of the title of Duke. But while this is quite sad for Leszek and his family, it's even more disturbing for Poland. After all, who is going to be in charge now? There's an unexpected power vacuum at the worst possible moment. We'll try to start answering that question in our next episode. In the meantime, if you enjoy the show, your support on Patreon is always deeply appreciated. For a couple of bucks an episode, you get access to exclusive perks, which come out on an ongoing basis. You can donate by going to patreon.com slash history of Poland podcast. Thanks to everyone who already supports the show. Until next time.